Well, like many of you, I, I read the papers and sometimes some magazines and I watch the news, a little bit of news on TV, not much. More recently, get most of my information online, various online sources. And the more I read and the more I observe, the more I feel that I'm being overloaded with information, just too much information, too many choices, too many new products, too many ideas. Everybody's got another new idea, the new and improved. For example, I read recently that the next generation of computers will be powered by liquid processors that will be three billion times faster than the newest ones. I can't even get my head around the idea that something will improve three billion uh, times uh, over the chips that we have today. And they say that the scientists are telling us that this advance uh, will bring us to the threshold of the development of true artificial intelligence where humans will have vital and meaningful interaction with machines. Never mind, I want meaningful reactions with people. You know, not machines, everybody's excited. Wow, we'll be able to talk to machines. Never mind, I want to be able to talk to my neighbor who's hiding out in his house because of COVID. And they're already marketing software, you know, that allows you to just talk to the machine and it'll spit out a, a, you know, a printed, uh, printed uh, a version of what you've just said. You know, and, and even as I say that, a lot of us are thinking, wow, well, that's old technology. Now this informational and technological deluge can be quite unnerving to those of us who are charged with the task of uh, communicating uh, the message of Jesus to the world. I mean, preachers, uh, they have to keep up with what's going on because they have to communicate to uh, every generation uh, the gospel of Christ. On one hand, uh, there are so many uh, new and competing ideas uh, being spread increasingly faster and faster throughout every nation, including our own. And then on the other hand, uh, we have in our day and age a much greater array of communication tools to do the job of spreading the gospel to every man and woman uh, on this earth. Uh, isn't that a, a amazing when you think of the potential, uh, our, our little, our little uh, ministry here in Choctaw, Oklahoma uh, has, you know, on YouTube, Bible Talk has a 10 million views, you know that a little church in the middle of nowhere uh, can preach the gospel to 10 million people. You know, that, imagine what we could do if we really tried. Uh, everything would be open to us. And so the challenge, I believe, is to keep our message crisp and clear, regardless of the medium we choose to deliver it in whether that be you know, preaching from the pulpit or the TV or radio or the internet or by mail, ads, billboards, one-on-one, -on -one, all kinds of ways to, to preach the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, I think that's the worst thing that's happened because of COVID. That's all we talk about is COVID. Yeah, well, the church wasn't put here to talk about COVID. The church was put here to talk about Jesus Christ. We must stick to the basic ideas of the Christian faith as it is taught in the Bible. Although the Bible itself is made up of 66 individual books and there, there have been millions of books and papers and articles that have been written that discuss and analyze and comment on it, as complicated as it all seems, Christianity, the religion of the Bible, can be summarized in three words. Three words that begin with the letter C. So that we don't get lost or confused by the crush of information that's out there about religion in general and Christianity in particular. I mean, do you know how much information you get? If you just type in you know, the word Jesus. What does it say here? 970 million results in 0.87 seconds. <laughs> Imagine if it, if, if it searched for five seconds, how much, how much you'd have. So there's a lot of stuff out there you know, about, about Jesus. So that we remain focused on the rock solid basis 
in 2021, I'd like to talk about the three C's of Christianity this morning. Now, I know you're probably racing way ahead of me trying to figure out the three C's. You've got them in your head already. I know what he's going to say and that's okay. Try to stick with me as we go through them one by one. So the first C of Christianity, well, of course, is Christ. It's Christ. Jesus Christ is what the Bible is all about. In the Old Testament, the writers described how God created the world that Jesus was to come into. They explained why he had to come to this world in the story of Adam's sin, which caused the human race to weaken and be subject to sinfulness and, and condemnation. Much of the Old Testament is devoted to showing how God created and nurtured a special nation, the Jews, from which Jesus would receive his cultural and religious nature. In other words, Israel was a, a historical stage upon which Jesus would make his entrance. That was their purpose. And with the writing of the New Testament, we have documents that describe his birth and his teaching and his ministry and his death and his resurrection. His followers recorded the beginnings of the church he established, as well as the remaining teachings that he provided through his apostles. But let's not forget that Christ is the core subject of the Bible and his person as well as his identity is the hinge upon which the whole of human history hangs. I mean, according to Jesus and the Bible, there are only two camps in the world. Two camps. Those who believe that he is the divine Messiah, the son of God, that's one camp. And those who do not believe this, and those who do not believe this should be reminded of Luke eleven twenty three 23, when Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. He didn't say those who are not with me are on the fence. No, no, if you're not with me, then you're against me is what he said. And so for Christians, uh, Jesus is the one that we preach. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22, Jesus is the one we hope for. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 1 verse 3, Jesus is the one who is going to judge. Acts 10.42, the one who rewards. Matthew 25.21, the Bible list goes on and on and on about who he is and what he does and what he will do. Jesus Christ is what Christianity is about. It's the study and the response to the question who he is, the son of God, and what he did. He saved us from our sins and from death. And when will he return? Well, only God knows that. And most importantly for us, who is with him and who is not with him? By virtue of your presence here today, whether you're here, here or in that room over there or you're online watching, you are making a statement. You're saying, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm with you. When you've answered these questions for yourself, you will have settled the most important issues of your existence. When you will have settled the question, who is Jesus Christ? and how will I respond to him, then you will know how to order the rest of your life. You wonder, especially younger people, how, what is life about and how am I going to order my way? Well, first of all, answer the question, who is Jesus? And then from that answer, you will be able to order your way in life. The second C in Christianity stands for the cross. Christ and the cross. There are any number of religions that promote a variety of spiritual concepts and experiences. The Buddhists emphasize a meditation. The Muslims have a pilgrimage to Mecca. 
Even within so-called Christian circles, there are groups who focus their entire energy in promoting a certain day that you have to worship or a specific name you've got to use when you, when you refer to God. There are others who live and die by being able to perform what they claim to be our miraculous acts or healings. And these, these may find their roots in biblical Christianity, but what they are focused on is not what Christianity is focused on. Christianity is about the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is about. This is, this is why Jesus said that he came in Matthew 16, 21. The cross is the main topic of the apostles preaching. In Acts chapter two, verse 36, Peter finishes his sermon with this concluding idea. He says, therefore, let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him Lord and Christ. There's the Christ part. This Jesus whom you crucified, there's the cross part. This is what our religion is about. And the number of references to the cross in Paul's preaching, for example, is as great even to the point where he summarizes the nature of his preaching style and the content with these words. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, he says, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, there's the, uh, the Christ part, and him crucified, there's the cross part. Of course, we in the churches of Christ have also been guilty of losing our focus when it comes to the essentials of Christianity. We're not blameless either. When people ask, what church do you go to? And you answer, the church of Christ. Do they say, oh, is that the church that preaches about Jesus and the cross? Is that that church? Or do they say, oh yeah, you're the guys that don't use a piano. Oh yeah, you're the guys who think you're the only ones going to heaven. Which do you think people will first say when you say, I go to the church of Christ? That we're the people who preach the cross? I think we're more famous for our stand on instrumental music and worship than our zeal for preaching the cross of Christ. And believe me, I, I don't have anything you know, about instrumental music. You know, a cappella singing in public worship is what the Bible teaches and it's what we do. I've got no hangups as far as that's concerned. I'm talking about priorities. No one was ever converted to Christ by being convinced that you mustn't use instruments in worship. Eventually you have to teach that, but you don't start with that. Why should we focus on the cross? Because preaching the cross is central because it's the answer to man's greatest problem and destructive force, which is sin. Sin is mankind's disobedience to God's laws and the reason why we die physically and spiritually at judgment. Sin is the reason we're afraid to die and we're afraid to face God because we know that all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and those who have sinned will be condemned to spiritual death, Romans 6.23. No one has the ability to overcome sin and thus be right and acceptable to God. Paul talks about that in Romans uh, chapter seven. And this is where the cross comes in. Jesus, the divine son of God became a human being in order to deal once and for all with sin. And he did this by offering his perfect life on the cross in order to pay the moral debt created by our sins. The significance of this act is explained in great detail by Paul in Romans chapters four, five, and six, basically, what Paul says is that God has dealt with man's sins in an absolute and historical manner at the cross. For example, at one point in your life, 
you are guilty of sin and you face condemnation before God. Listen, what comfort do we have that our beloved Dave Roberts was taken from us by a, a virus? Here's a guy uh, who was on top of the Murrow building you know, when it was blown up. Here's a guy who ran into uh, houses that were on fire. Here's a guy that scuba dived to, to find dead bodies. Here's a guy who did all these things and boom, he's taken out by what? Something you can't even see. And what comfort do we have? The comfort that we have is we know that Dave Roberts confessed the name of Christ and had confidence in his cross, as did Jerry Corneli and other Christians who have been felled by this illness. At another point in your life, you are forgiven for all of your sins and you are guaranteed eternal life. It's only this thought that that makes the losing of our brothers and sisters and our loved ones even bearable. And the point at which the difference occurs is the cross of Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? Once you were lost and then you were saved and what's, what point did you get saved? Well, the cross makes that possible. Peter the apostle uh, summarizes it this way. He says, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. First Peter 2.24. And so the cross is a, a historical event that God uh, prepared for several thousand years and that has stood for an additional 2000 years. Your life is either the one you had before you knew about and accepted the cross or it's the new life that you now experience after you have received the forgiveness that flows from the cross. You're in one of two camps. There is no third camp. Without the cross, Christianity is simply a religious self-help program steeped in Jewish history. That's it. The fact that Christ died on the cross, however, transforms our faith into the only solution uh, to the universal problem uh, of sin. The cross wipes away our sins. We're no longer responsible for our moral debt before God. It's paid in full at the cross. What a comfort that is when I screw up. <laughs> you know, Lisa and I are watching shows. We're binge watching like you guys, I guess. We're binge watching some shows, you know, and, and, and now we've gotten to the point where we, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of trying to give the dialogue before the actors give the dialogue because we've seen so much of it. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is there'll be a dramatic moment and something will happen and there'll be some danger or somebody will be in trouble. And, and one of the characters will, will, will go, uh, oh, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. And then they say, I promise. And Lisa and I, together we go, I promise, you know, we try to get that in before the character says it. And I want to pull what little hair I have out of my head when they say that. You promise what? You've got nothing to promise. You have no power to promise. The only thing that has power is the cross. Why? Because God's promise is attached to it. Every other promise we make is, a shot in the dark, a shot in the dark. The cross satisfies God's demand that we be righteous and now confers upon us the righteousness or the perfection of Christ himself because of the cross. I don't know about you, but I want to be perfect. Don't hold it against me. I want to be perfect. I just can't, but the cross guarantees me that I am perfect before God. The cross absolves us of punishment. Jesus suffered the punishment that was supposed to be our punishment called death. The cross brings peace because if God forgives me, 
then I can forgive me. You see, you can't forgive yourself for all your stuff unless God has already forgiven you. You can go ahead and try to forgive yourself all you want, but if God hasn't forgiven you, you can't forgive yourself. But if God has forgiven you, if your sins have been washed away in the, in the waters of baptism, you can then go ahead and forgive yourself and it'll stick, it'll be meaningful, it'll bring peace. And then of course the cross gives me hope. No matter what happens in this life, the cross reassures me that I can look forward to heaven with confidence. I don't know about you, all these changes, put the mask on, take the mask off, don't go here, six feet apart, 12 feet apart, 10 day quarantine, 14 day, do I get the vaccine, don't I get the vaccine? You know, the only thing I know is that I'm a Christian and I know as a Christian what I need to do. COVID, no COVID, war, no war, great economy, not great economy. We become a communist country. We say some, some sort of democratic country. It doesn't matter to me. I know what I have to do. I know the life I've got to live. Sometimes it's a little easier to live that life and maybe in the future, it'll be a little more difficult to live that life, but it'll always be the same life that I've got to live. And that's my life in Jesus Christ, proclaiming his cross. Make it hard for me, make it easy for me, it doesn't matter. I keep forging ahead. The cross of Jesus is the focal point of our religion, the heart and soul of our message, which is the gospel. So we have the first C, Christ, the second C, the cross, and the third C, the church. How many got them all right? How many guessed them all? Oh, good, good. Some folks think that they don't need the church in order to be good Christians. Or they say that they don't need the church in order to have a relationship with God. I like that one, I like when people, I don't like that, but I mean, I have to smile when people say, that. I don't need the church to have a relationship with God, really? Saying this is like saying that we don't need to have a body in order to have a relationship with our heads. Because the Bible teaches that the church is the body of Christ who is the head, Colossians 1.18. In the same way that just a finger cannot have a relationship to the head without the rest of the body, or just our foot can't have a relationship with the head without the rest of the body, an individual believer cannot have a relationship with Christ without being connected in some way to the rest of his body, which is the church. The Bible also teaches that there is only one entity which is officially recognized by God and by Christ as his body, and that is the church, Ephesians 4 verse 4. There is only one body. I mean, you wouldn't try to connect a toaster to your head, right? Or a tree trunk or the body of an animal to a human head. Would you try to do that? Well, no, of course not. Only a human body goes with a human head. Well, in the same way, the only body compatible to the head of Christ is the church of Christ. We need to remember that. Jesus died on the cross for the specific reason of creating a group of people who were saved. That group saved by Jesus is called the church. In turn, the church is the instrument that God uses to preserve the truth of the gospel, 1 Timothy 3.15, and the vehicle to spread the good news about Jesus and the cross and what they are supposed to mean to all men. The church's role is to proclaim the gospel. The Bible explains that the church is the bride of Christ. It also says that he will return to earth in order to exalt the church to the right hand of God forever. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. So if you're not part of the body, the church, you cannot be connected to the head, which is Christ, nor do you have access to his cross and the forgiveness that it provides. The church is the third and final element in the Christian faith, without which Christianity would have perished along with the death of the first century apostles and disciples. And so uh, being a Christian is not simple or easy. There is struggle and, and there needs to be uh, perseverance in faith. But it is easy to remember the three basic elements upon which our faith is based and must remain focused at all times. First, Christ, the divine Savior and Lord. You know, people say, I don't, I don't know about uh, uh, talking to my friend or my husband or a cousin or whatever. I don't know, I don't know how to get into, you know, maybe talking religion. Very simple. Uh, just ask them the question, who do you think Jesus Christ is? I just know, I'm just curious. You know, I mean, we've known each other for so long and we've talked about sports and baseball and politics and everything. I'm just curious, who do you think Jesus Christ is? I mean, the person is either going to say, you know, I don't want to talk about that and never talk to, my, to me about that again. Okay, fine, now we know, you know. Or he'll say, well, I'm not sure. And you'll say, well, take a guess. What do you think? I'm just looking for your opinion. You want to get it into the conversation. But the conversation must always begin with Christ himself. And then the church, excuse me, the cross, the place where our sins are cleansed. What's the message that Christ brings? You're a sinner. I've taken away your sins on the cross. That's the message. And then the church, the only body connected to Christ and charged with the responsibility of proclaiming his cross. That job does not go to anybody else. If we don't do it, no one else will do it. Who, you think the government is going to do it? You know, we have political parties that go out of their way to declare that they have no use for God. Oh, well, they're not going to be preaching the gospel. Walmart going to be preaching the gospel? No. That job belongs to us, the church. This is our responsibility, proclaiming the cross. Now at the beginning I told you not to get too far ahead of me. And if you follow it along, this lesson brings with it a measure of good news and bad news, like a good news, bad news sermon, depending on who you are. So let's start with the good news, shall we? Here's the good news. The good news is that you now know enough to be saved. <laughs> That's good news. Nothing is left. There's no mystery. If you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, if you accept His cross to wipe away your sins, if, if you have or are willing to express your faith in Him as Jesus uh, has commanded us to do so uh, in repentance and baptism, uh, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, two scripture references that talk about that, then the good news is that you know the truth. You have responded in faith to that truth and you will receive the reward of that truth. So prepare yourself for a blissful eternal life. No matter what is happening here in this fallen and sinful world. That's the good news. Okay, now, the bad news, the bad news is there's no excuse. There's no excuse because you know the good news. At the judgment, and there will be a judgment, no one in this building or who is watching online who has reached the age of reason will be able to offer the excuse that they didn't know. Now you will be able to say, I didn't care, or I didn't believe, or I, I put it off, or I loved my sins, or I just wasn't sure, but nobody here will be able to say, I didn't know. We now all know. So I hope everyone can hear my lesson today 
and see it as good news for them. If it's anything else, why not make things right today? Imagine the first Lord's Day in 2021 by coming forward for baptism or prayer or a recommitment to the Lord's church as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please? <laughs> 